as Eugenio said, I'd, I want to uh, contextualize a little bit the, the term information society because I realize it's not everybody's cup of tea. Some people think it's uh, a good descriptor of um, today's societies. Other people would like to rail against it, and I'll do a little bit of both. Um, and I'd like to put it into the context of thinking about some of the prospects for applying the idea and thinking about it um, in the context of what does it mean in terms of both governance in the sense of policy making, including developing countries, but also some of the micro aspects and practices. So I won't avoid the micro, but this isn't going to be a detailed set of case studies about the implementation of information and communication technologies. <coughs> so um, I think I'll start off with some background. And then what I hope to do, and Gino had told me this was very informal, he didn't lead me to believe there were necessarily 30 <laughs> people, but I'm taking him as his word because I'm going to try out some ideas that are fairly recent which have to do with how we understand the relationship between ICTs and collective action. So I think there's a lot of problems in that area that haven't been fully worked out. So I'm going to try out some ideas on you as well. Uh, no. How about this? Yeah. Okay. So first of all, just for some background, you may have read about um, scholars on the Information Society uh, or not, but I think we can take it as read that the concept itself is extremely fuzzy. I would start by saying that all societies are information societies in some sense. All societies have had oral traditions that are about information. So the notion that we apply information society to the late 20th, early 21st century is uh, something which deserves critique for that reason alone. If you read the literature, uh, coming from virtually all disciplines, you see some people who think the information society associated with digital technologies, the internet, is a utopian idea. Nothing but good can come of it. If only ICTs were to, spread, to diffuse widely throughout the world, mm -hmm. individuals become, could become better empowered. We would be on the road to um, a good society, to democratization. On the other hand, you see very dystopian accounts. The dystopian accounts see technology not as something which is enabling, but something that may be disabling. <coughs> and you can place that into any context you like. It could be that um, we suffer today from information overload, for example. Or you could put it into the context of the flow of the media and see the more hegemonic way in which more dominant media filter into other societies and see that as a dystopian account. There are in-between stories, but for the most part, the literature has been very uh, divided. Within that framework, again, there is a dominant kind of perspective and a dominant perspective about the information society. Basically, in a nutshell, goes, if better versions of technology can be built, bigger broadband, faster computers, etc. They should be. Because if they are, they will bring us productivity gains, they will bring us economic growth, and after all, that can't be bad. So there is a dominant vision that associates developments and innovations in information and communication technologies with the economic development argument. And also, it's associated with augmenting military strength. After all, better sensor technologies can be used mm -hmm. for military purposes, etc. And alongside that dominant vision, there has always been a more critical vision. And the more critical vision has come from cultural studies, from sociolo sociology, from anthropology, from political um, studies, and from more critical studies of economics, which basically said that if we begin to understand the dynamics of the transformations that are going on, around these technologies, we may be able to, armed with that understanding, inform social action in a way that disrupts the dominant vision. And in that sense, perhaps, put developments in ICTs into service of enabling people rather than disabling them. So that, if you, if you like, is the fuzziness of the concept. You can find people who take all sorts of different perspectives. Um, the information society in modern times, 
basically is a term that gets started in the mid-1960s, early 1970s, when people get, began to realize that more and more um, of wealthy economies were being driven by services, by immaterial um, production and by information goods and services. Daniel Bell, who wrote <coughs> around the time of, um, he talked about the post-industrial society, but he used the term information society for the first time in 1979, and basically put it in the context of saying technology is the instrumental mode of rational action. And by technology, he meant information and communication technologies that enable a new form of rational action, instrumentalized through the better and faster processing of information. Technology has created a new definition of rationality, a new mode of thought. This was the zeitgeist of the times. Now, many people s attributed this to a very American, if you like, view of technological innovation and progress and modernization. But it wasn't just a Western idea. It was picked up at the same time in Japan and other Asian countries, where most of the focus was on faster processing of information digital technologies underlying that faster processing, again, the dominant mode of technological change leading to economic efficiency, productivity gains, wealth creation. So that was very much the dominant um, perspective. It was all tied to the broader context of the promise of technological innovation. In that sense, information and communication technologies weren't seen as all that much different from any other earlier phases of technological innovation. Better ICTs produced, widely diffused, would lead to more efficient markets. Productivity and economic growth, as I've already said. There was a contagious belief in the market and the value of information, the economic value of information for consumers and by somewhat illogical extension for citizens. The notion, if you read the development literature from the time, and even now, if you read it critically, was that knowledge is like light. There's no difference between information and knowledge. Knowledge or information can flow and transfer from one head to the other if you have sophisticated ICTs. Now, most of you who imagine are critical scholars will be saying, no, 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 no. But this was and is, in some literature, a very pervasive view. There's very little. Um, room for maneuver between the idea that information and knowledge are the same thing. All we need is better ICTs, more internet connections, more mobile phones, and we will have the possibility for development. That was the main promise. Um, and it wasn't a very big step <coughs> from the information society to the knowledge society. Um, here, a quoting mm -hmm. from uh, Paul David, who was for a time associated with the Oxford in Internet Institute, and who is a um, very highly regarded colleague of mine. He is an economist and a historian, and his colleague Do uh, Dominique Fauré, they uh, prefer the term knowledge society. And this quote, knowledge has been at the heart of economic growth and the gradual rise in levels of social well-being since time immemorial. The ability um, to invent and innovate, that is, to create new knowledge and new ideas that are then embodied in products, processes, and organizations, as always serve to fuel development. Now, if you leave the fuel development out, you might have not too much problem with the statement itself. But it's the jump from the enabling of ICTs and digital technologies, I would argue, to knowledge, to fueling development as if it was some, which is very much an economistic idea, like a pump or something like that. You're just pumping in more technology and more information and more knowledge, and somehow you can model the productivity gains, et cetera. Well, economists can do that, but as anyone knows, ideal models are not models in practice. And there's a long way between those models and the way in which information communication technologies are really informing development processes. Um, for economists, the persistent emphasis in the literature in this area, whether you call it an information society or a knowledge society, has been on the accumulation of useful knowledge 
Now, useful knowledge, yes. You might say, well, if people in communities find something useful, who could complain? But their notion of useful knowledge is largely to do with science in the market. In other words, the valuation, the validation of knowledge in this particular way of thinking is very much science-based, progressive, modernization, or market-based, economic growth and valuation. And so in a sense, it's the conversion of this, which I love. This is a library which I like, given my age, to spend all my time in. I'm not so keen on the digital <laughs> libraries. But it is the conversion of the, of the stores of stocks of knowledge, if you like, that have existed since time immemorial in specific places, quite often in the West, into digital bits, which then can be transferred into other places, which is the model with very little account for what goes on in those contexts themselves. And there has always been a dissenting view. Knowledge cannot be universalized. There is no singular information society, but rather many information societies, many knowledge societies, and that unless we take account of those that pure plurality and diversity and link all of these developments to local contexts, we have a skewed view of what the information society is all about. So this persistent emphasis on the accumulation of useful knowledge certainly serves some purposes. I don't suppose anybody in this room is against advances in scientific knowledge. I don't suppose anybody in this room is completely against markets and commercialization and rewarding people for their labor and payment. I mean, maybe one or two of you. Mostly, we do live in a society in which commercialization of information does matter. So when I say the accent is on science and market useful knowledge, I don't mean that this is completely bad. I mean that the dominant view of information societies has privileged that view, creating relatively little space for alternative views. Um, when this way of seeing the world, if you like, starts being translated into governance, policy, regulation, which affects networks like the internet or social media applications, etc., what tends to happen, and I'll come to some more spe specifics in a minute, is most of the initiatives mimic the dominant view, most of them. The discourse that they use, tends to mimic the notion that these developments around ICTs are really mainly about science, progressive increases in, in information-driven dri wealth. But at the same time, and particularly over the last decade and a half, we have seen in global governance institutions more and more involvement of civil society organizations, some of them closely linked to grassroots communities, some of them rel relatively distant from them. And their initiatives have begun to challenge the legitimacy of this dominant view of ICTs. <coughs> now we can talk about how much they challenge them and how effectively. But the question I ask you to think about as we go on is that if there is a top-down kind of dominant vision which is driven by science and driven by the market and technological innovation in the information society, and if there is a kind of a counter-movement which comes from international NGOs, other NGOs working uh, more locally in countries in the global south or in the poorer areas of um, wealthy countries. And if they're challenging this view, A, what are they challenging it with? What are their arguments? And B, is there or are there opportunities be created for more participatory action around ICTs than would otherwise be the case if everything is driven by the kind of top-down vision of how to make use of ICTs. So that's the question. Um, I wouldn't like to imply that every global intergovernmental institution which has taken on the information society agenda um, is completely driven by science and by the market. 
that wouldn't be true and it wouldn't be fair. Um, UNESCO, for example, has consistently said, going back some years now, that they will put into a practice a concept of knowledge societies, plurality, or information societies, that is inclusive, pluralistic, equitable, open, and participatory. A distinct shift in the narrative about what are knowledge societies or information societies. Um, the first time, to my knowledge, that UNESCO used the plurality term of knowledge societies instead of this singular universal vision was in 2005, just prior to the World Summit on the Information Society, um, which was the first time that ICT <coughs> has really traveled up to the top of the heads of state agenda asking the question, how can ICTs be put into service in support of the empowerment of people? UNESCO um, has since published many reports. I put this one up here because it's a bit earlier. This is 1998, when a similar story was told, this time actually by me, for the UN Commission on Science, Technology and Development. So this tussle, if you like, between a dominant view and a view that says, actually, there are possibilities for ICTs to be used in inclusive, participatory ways, if only we could figure out how to enable that to happen, has been going on for quite some time. It's not a, a new development. The question is whether there's a space for optimism. Um, again, coming back to both the literature and studies of these reports, of which there are many, some by me, but some by other scholars, coming from many different disciplines, what you find over and over again is that there's very little examination explicitly of the power relations which are informing the tensions between these top-down models and the more mm -hmm. participatory visions of information societies. Quite often in the policy domain, when it comes to prescriptive policy, what should be done, you find normative prescriptions for the optimal way of capitalizing on the claimed benefits of ICTs or the media. And quite often, and again not exclusively, the principal answer is marketization, privatization as the first answer versus calls for diversity, different models for different places, for different times, sometimes public, sometimes private, sometimes hybrid, to redress existing inequalities. So the top-down model looks at ICTs or it looks at the media and, he said, and it says, how far is it spread? How much does it cost? What does the diffusion curve look like? The more bottom-up perspectives say, wait a minute, it's the social world, it's the world in which people live their everyday lives that matters first and foremost. And the secondary question is, is it conceivable that these technologies may be enabling in some way? So I would argue that a productive research domain, and I often say this to our uh, master's students, and I'm sure I've said it to a genio in the past, <laughs> not when you were a master's student. Understanding how and why the conflicts occur between these different ways of seeing the information society is hugely important so that resources of all different kinds can be mobilized amongst different actors to reduce social, political, and economic harms. Now, you don't necessarily see the word ICTs in there, do you? My point is that if we don't start, we should not start with ICTs, nor should we start with media necessarily. Mm -hmm. We should start with human problems and human development issues and then see how these technologies might be incorporated into people's lives, emphasizing diversity of possibilities and efforts to um, address inequality. However, having said that, I wouldn't like to sound like I think that we should only emphasize participatory bottom-up initiatives to try to um, enable people to use these technologies. Because I think there is a great danger that you can tip too far, if you like. And the great danger is that in rejecting the top-down models, the universal information society, a kind of Al Gore, Bill Gates notion that give them mobiles and um, welfare will be improved. There is a possibility of 
overreacting and descending into a kind of reactionary localism, which is how I would read some of the stories about, say, the role of Twitter uh, or Facebook in the Arab Spring, for instance. Initially, when all of that was happening a couple of years ago, people were saying, oh, ICTs are causing or responsible for this uprising and it will necessarily lead to democratization. Necessarily. A kind of linear notion of the impact of technologies on society. It's almost an exact reversal of the dominant vision. And uh, I would argue as dangerous. Because as we know, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or whatever ICTs in these, other, these societies who are having very um, dramatic conflicts at the moment, whether or not they come out of them with a more um, uh, just society, I really do not think is attributable to ICTs per se. It will be attributable to a whole complex range of issues. So in going from the dominant model to a more par participatory emphasis, I, I kind of warn you against descending into the kind of participation only version of bottom-up kinds of ways of addressing the information society. Um, I was trying, I have been trying to think of a sort of simple way to put this juxtaposition of the different models. And here I come to the theme of the commons, information commons and collective action. And a very simple way of seeing these debates about information societies is to, is to say <coughs> a lot of the debate is skewed or biased toward a more market-led vision. In the economistic literature, much of the discussion is about information exchange or knowledge exchange, exchange of bits, buying and selling bits and bytes. Much of the debate is about the scarcity of information, whether it's the scarcity of the radio frequency spectrum, whether it's the scarcity <coughs> of um, high quality information pro products, a traditional model which some would say has been overtaken by the internet. After all, don't we have information abundance now? But it really is a model that is market led about information exchange, how that best can happen to create economic value. You create economic value out of information by ensuring it's scarce somehow, imposing intellectual property rights on it. And the whole development process is driven largely by technological mastery. More science, faster innovation, faster internet, global spread of the internet. And a counterpoint to that, if you like, is, especially in recent years, the alternative model, a commons-led model, a notion that says, ah, actually society is based on cooperation sharing, not competition and market exchange. Actually, given the changes that have happened in the information environment, we have abundant information, so why should we want to try to make it scarce? And what we should rely upon is bottom-up generative information by open source software communities, by any kinds of people who um, have a vision of um, empowering and enabling others at a distance. I'm putting the two quite starkly here, but in a sense that is institutionally and at the level of practice, where many of the debates go on, um, is this a possible future? A realignment? Or is it just a fantasy that the power relations will somehow work themselves out in a way that is much more inclusive, equitable, and that there's some kind of accommodation between these two models? Not that this one goes away. And not that this one, as some would argue, becomes absolutely ascendant, but rather that there is, you could call it a hybridization, or you might call it an accommodation, something that works both in favor of the market, but also in favor of enabling social change. Can you imagine this happening? And if you can't imagine that happening, how might it happen? If you study, and I have actually reviewed hundreds and hundreds going on to maybe even thousands of research projects 
and around ICTs, different regions of the world. And the um, studies in social sciences, which have been done on them. What you see time and again is initiatives which are largely top down. They might be about ICTs and trade. They might be about ICTs <coughs> in the financial sector or money exchange. Quite often they're driven by the economic model where information is like light, where knowledge is like light. On the other hand, you see fewer, but nonetheless um, a goodly number of studies dominated by studies of social process, sociology, some by media studies, studies of um, the role of public service broadcasting, for example, studies coming from cultural studies, which are much more interested in transnationalization and how information and the representation of people enables us to understand and maybe have a dialogue with others. So once again, you have two different traditions, and you have also this bifurcation between studies, projects, and initiatives, which are really technology-driven. Let's design a new application, a new mapping <laughs> um, phenomenon. <coughs> um, <coughs> let's give everybody uh, tablets so they can con collect information. To the other extreme, let's look into the local context and see what people actually say they want. What kind of information do they need? Maybe the newspaper would do it. Maybe the radio would do it. Or maybe they do need access to the internet. But the assumption that the technology should come first is not always there in these studies. Question. If we were to locate, and I don't really mean quantitatively, I just mean locate, the different initiatives coming from global governance institutions, the vast majority of them are still over here. I would say in the mid-1990s, they were almost exclusively over there. There were hardly any voices. There was, there was just the global information society was going to make everything all right. Since then, with these more critical voices coming from civil society organizations, grassroots organizations, I would argue they're starting to shift and there's more of a dialogue back and forth. And that's what I think is interesting. Because I do not think, you may disagree with me, that this is going to go away. I really don't. I do not think that this will become the only ascendant way of viewing information societies and investing in them. I think there will be a dialogue across a convergence. Question. In that dialogue and in that space, is there room for participatory action? Um, just to give a, a very brief example of um, how <coughs> the notion of an information commons open access to information enabled by open technologies is really catching on. Um, of late, both big governance organizations and bottom-up organizations are becoming really infatuated with real-time big data, it's called. Not just for science, but for mapping sanitation problems in slum places, for mapping land rights and ownership rights in various slum dwellings, for any kind of human humanitarian assistance or emergency relief you can think of. Um, the UN itself has a big uh, initiative called Global Pulse, which I won't say too much about. But a lot of this is based on the idea of crowdsourcing. What is crowdsourcing? Crowdsourcing basically just means um, announce yourself and ask for help online. And people are, do volunteer, and people do bring information and offer um, uh, information quite often at the local level. This is just a, um, a picture of uh, the Map Kibera project, which was in, um, is, was, is in uh, Kenya, in Nairobi. It's a big slum, and much, is, much media attention is focused on this. And they basically pay, or sometimes don't pay, local people to bring their own information 
and input it into the mobile phone, and the mobile phone information goes into a database, and the database is compiled, and that information is combined sometimes with more authoritative information coming from various UN organizations, World Health Organization, etc. And the idea is that this, these big data sets can then be applied in humanitarian contexts. A good role of ICTs. Problem. Because the dominant model that I was talking about earlier is still there, working alongside this more bottom-up model, what has happened in the experience of implementing Global Pulse, which hasn't got terribly far so far? There are huge concerns about privacy of the human beings who are contributing to the mapping, particularly on the gender side. Women who contribute information about their households or whatever. What happens when this information is then put into public domain? Yes, it's guaranteed to be anonymous, but can it be mapped back to those individuals? Ethics. Is it ethical to go around encouraging people to contribute their information and then take it off into the um, UN spheres or domains of big databases and combine it and never return? because the funding stops. Who should have access to the data? Everyone, researchers, scientists, commercial operators who want to build services around it, particularly in the health sector. And there's institutional rivalry. Everyone wants to get into the crowdsourcing act. Everyone from UNCTAD to UNESCO to ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, to the World Health Organization. Every one of them at the global governance level wants to do this. And they don't want to share their data. Not very much, anyway. Then there's institutional rivalry, not only in terms of sharing, but what standards should be used to organize the data. My standard is better than your standard. So let's have a competition. Let's not put the data together because we haven't resolved the competitive struggle. And then there are threats to reputation. Information all by itself is virtually meaningless. It depends on what you do with it. So there are the skills at the interpretive level. How do you compile the information? What story does it tell you? Are things getting better in Kibera? What kinds of interventions? should be brought into the community. All this around ICTs and the promise of technological innovation. Message, the notion of the information commons as being a good thing as opposed to the market is a myth. Things are much more complicated on both sides. Um, some of you will know the work of Eleanor Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize for Economics um, a year and a half ago. Um, she, from 1990, not in the ICT area, but wrote extensively <coughs> on collective action in, co in a commons. She was very, very, very keen to understand the social dynamics, cultural dynamics, political dynamics, <coughs> and economic dynamics of the way people interact, not in necessarily in competitive arrangements, but collaboratively. Now, it's not a very big step from collaboratively in any walk of life, whether manager in the fisheries or the forests or ICT-based information resources. And her work is being applied in that area. And her argument was that the outcomes of interactions in a commons take away the barriers to accessing information, just make information available, can be either positive or negative or somewhere in between. In other words, that side of my map, which showed market versus commons, is not just one homogeneous thing called the commons. There are many, many, many different outcomes that can result from the commons. She also said that strong collective action is needed to avoid the risk of commons in the prop in the uh, the risk of problems in the commons. So again, is there an in-between mode for managing commons relationships alongside market relationships? Now remember, 
her model is mainly about the commons. She's mostly concerned about the right-hand side of my earlier diagram and how we organize and govern in that space. And I've been largely criticizing the market view as saying it's a bit too dominant. It's pushing a top-down notion of ICTs and the diffusion of technology without concern with the contextual side. She's mostly interested in the contextual way of governing inside the commons. So I'm asking the question, what about the in-between? What about the space for hybridization? How do you manage in that in-between space? Is it possible to imagine institutional, organizationally, and even micro-practices do not pull hugely away from the market so that they alienate market driven processes. Recognize the complexity of what goes on inside the commons, but begins to build in, in between space. And it seems to me that some of that is beginning to happen. She also makes the point very strongly that there is a continuum between top down and bottom up authority when it comes to information. So if you think about the top-down, UN-driven push of ICTs and information, basically it assumes that control is exercised around interests in information accuracy and accountability. So in the global policy map comparisons, the UN agencies want to know that the information is true, if you like verified and accurate. They want to know if they can apply it in their models. And for them, the outcome, the best outcome of all of the crowdsourcing activity of Mapkibera to uh, address disease or health or low-income problems <coughs> is to accumulate useful information so that it can be re reused and recombined for scientific purposes and in the economy. The other end of the spectrum, you have a lot of dispersed, localized, contextualized, bottom-up collective action. Here you have multiple authorities and peer relationships. Think of peer-to-peer -peer, um, file sharing. Anywhere to do with music or downloading movies or any kind of file sharing. Well, that kind of file sharing can go on in any walk of life. A lot of apps that are being developed now that are being used on smartphones are really all to do with peer-to-peer -peer relationships. There, there is no single controller. Consistency and accuracy of information is subject to negotiation. People sit in villages and discuss whether or not one person's view of what the problems are is the same as another person's view. There's voluntary compliance. It's not it's top-down standards. And these kinds of um, developments are very characteristic of a lot of voluntary action, lots of different forms of collective action, offline and online. It's characteristic of open source communities, commons based peer production, as Banquet calls it. And what is the outcome? The outcome is not the accumulation of useful knowledge in the science or economic sense, it's the information as inputs for some kind of social, political, or economic collaborative action. So once again, we have the tension between these different models at work. And the question, what is the space in between these? How can it be best developed? So in thinking about how it might be best developed, I'm going to stop at about mm -hmm. how many minutes? Five. Five? Yeah. OK, I am. Um, I w I've been commissioned just recently to write a world report for UNESCO. <laughs> for my sins, on um, knowledge societies for peace and sustainable d development is their most recent set of buzzwords. Um, and the question that I decided to put before them was very much this question about the in-between space, the space between the dominant model that they feel comfortable with, or some, some do, and the more participatory bottom-up model that some others feel comfortable with. What is the space? for new combinations across public, private, civil society, and hybridized action in terms of who takes the initiative. What is the space in between, between market and commons? What instances can we see? Are they workable? What makes them sustainable around ICTs? 
and then looking across these different issue areas. Can we see, can we encourage more hybridization across these dimensions in the field of education and learning, which seems to me to be a kind of critical area when it comes to knowledge. In the case of media and mediated content, in cases where there are real tensions between whose information or knowledge is deemed to be verified and accurate as opposed to whose information and knowledge is negotiated as having some kind of truth standing. In the field of freedom of expression and political transparency, where so much hope is placed in ICTs, again, to put it rather crassly, give them mobiles and democratization will follow. Um, it's a very crass way of putting it. But there is a certain logic to that statement, and it's seen over and over and over in the mainstream media. Freedom of expression is clearly a value, but whose freedom of expression? Whose interpretation of that expression? Whose representations of people's identities actually matter? And how do we manage that in an equitable, just way across these different dimensions? Gender sensitivity. How do we man manage those kinds of relations when we have these tensions between top-down initiatives around ICTs and bottom-up? Environmental sustainability, another issue area. For some controversial, for some not so controversial, but again, from a point of view of initiating, enabling work around ICTs and development, if there's a goal which is somehow to do with environmental sustainability, what mix of institutions, bottom up, top down kinds of initiatives are needed? And then finally, ethical considerations, um, which I think I need not say more about. So, to come back to my earlier point, is this rebalancing a possible future around ICTs and governance of the information society? Is it possible to think of a new bridging between strong collective action, the kind that Ostrom talks about, in the market-led side of things, as well as the dispersed kind of enabling peer-to-peer -peer interaction online? Um, when we look around in the economic crisis, we see more and more signs of collaborative action, whether it comes through regulation and attempts to regulate markets, for example, top-down and bottom-up kinds of people coming together um, in order to strengthen collective action, not just the individualized notion of the market. In many, many domains of ICT production, we see more and more alliances in the corporate world, bringing together teams of developers of ICTs collaboratively. No notion of cutthroat competition. I mean, there is, certainly, but it's not as omnipresent as it once was. So what, is there a possible future of something in between? And lastly, um, <coughs> I really will stop. When it comes to thinking about what UNESCO's strategic priorities in this whole information or knowledge societies area, now, today, more or less as we speak, um, it is possible to move them a little bit beyond access to information and knowledge, which is language they're used to, and to talk about rights to information, the bottom up, to talk about enabling participation, balancing partnerships between different stakeholders, emphasize learning, women, marginalized groups, work and fair employment. These are all things that are okay. But it's UNESCO we're talking about. And UNESCO wants to emphasize the bottom-up, participatory, inclusive kind of dynamics. So when we wrote a report, which I'm co-authoring with a French-Canadian named Gaetan Tremblay, and mentioned economics, and talk about possibility of some kind of interfacing between that dominant model and more bottom-up empowering models. You can't talk about economics in a UNESCO report, I'm told. You can talk about intellectual property rights, but you can only talk about the commons. You can talk about Eleanor Ostrom, of course, she's a prize, uh, prize winner <laughs> of a Nobel Prize. 
Yes, she had much to say and it's applicable, possibly, to the management of information resources in the Commons. <coughs> no, you cannot talk about the market-driven commercialization model working alongside it. That's the International Telecommunication Union's business. That's UNCTAD business. So Robin, go away and rewrite your report and take out the chapters on the economics of innovation, on the economics of intellectual property rights, and talk to us about the cultural, political, enabling, participatory kinds of things. Well, that was the first draft of the report. I haven't taken it out. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Only point I'm making by this anecdote is just how difficult it is to get policymakers at the top, technology developers, and more open, open source, collaborative communities talking together about that space in between. The context between them continues. It is real. And I would argue it matters because a huge amount of money is spent on projects supposedly using ICTs for development in ways that are empowering. We'll stop there. So, so we have a bit of time for questions. If anyone has any for comments? Good thing. Um, thank you, Rob. That was brilliant. Um, it strikes me that that balancing problem is exactly what's happening with the Finch Report and the RCUK open access models. Because as open access has developed over the last 15 years or so, it's been very much a commons-led activity. And the particular policy that's been put in place is the most market-led version imaginable of open access. And of course, the academics are all up in arms because we thought we were getting this, and suddenly we're getting this. And it, it's all playing out in very interesting ways. Um, what do you think is happening with that? I mean, does, would you see that as this kind of example of attention? It is a good example. Um, it's an example of this translation process, which goes on in what I would call this in-between space, which I wouldn't, it's not the case that nobody in the academic world or the policy world is aware of this space. There are, many, there are people. But what tends to happen, it seems to me, that in the implementation of policy, time and again, what you get is exactly what you <laughs> just described. You get, oops, you get this. So now in terms of open science, open access, what we have is the research councils and or universities and individuals needing to pay money in order to publish. And this is seen as a good thing because information will be free and open. And it started out much more as a collaborative sharing idea. So in the translation in between, in the implementation of policy, um, I was just at a workshop on Open Commons kinds of things in Cambridge about a month ago, and they too were talking about this issue of a translation. So I think as people who are aware of example after example of where this tends to happen, this, this biasing, the question is um, what kinds of institutionalist normative arguments can we make? to work towards rebalancing, not in an automatic way, but in terms of the medium and long term. Because if we carry on this way, we'll carry on having <laughs> examples like you just described. I personally, over the last 20 years, would say that I have seen increasing numbers of instances of spaces of the in-between, where I thought that something would, maybe I was more rash, but in my younger days, take the, take the case of, um, Privacy, inva privacy invading um, technologies. Um, I suppose when I started writing about that in the old days of intelligent networks and what have you, I really did think that the centralization of databases was going to lead to this centralization of information about people regardless of their desires. That didn't happen. Or it pa only happened partly, and it only happened in some countries. So there, is, there was a much broader spectrum of practice. Why? Because companies themselves realized that it wasn't particularly in their interest to carry on competing over information scarcity. They do see reasons to share information. 
And in the crowdsourcing example, there are some companies who do see reasons to share information with local groups. That, you know, it's not just all a one-way street. So what I'm talking about is building on Ostrom's insights about collective action, and she sees many, many varieties of it within the commons. Why can we not begin to think of many, many varieties between the commons and the market, many more than we are currently hypothesizing? That's the question I'm raising. Thank, thank you very much for that. I, I have two thoughts. One is one which sort of continues on, on what you're saying now. I do some work on China. And what you just said struck me in the sense that one of the things that I'm noticing now is that obviously in China you have the extreme example of a hyper-modernist government which thinks it can completely plan and top-down control the entire information order. You also have companies that obviously want primarily to make a buck because they're companies and you have the public which essentially wants to you know, use the internet for whatever purpose that, that they see fit. And you see that increasingly there are sort of interesting links between both against the government, and Google is a particularly fine example in that sense, where the reason that Google left China in essence was because it had been told that it would need to move more information storage onto servers within the People's Republic of China therefore compromising its security. Now for any internet-based company that deals with the data of private individuals, I would imagine that absolute trustworthiness, I need to be able to you know, trust Google in not giving my data to the Chinese government, especially not if I'm going to be critical about certain things. Um, and, and, and that was one of the reasons why they left, uh, because it made business sense to not be active in a country where this sort of um, effort would be asked from it just might be an interesting example. Um, but, but on that imbalance, I'm, per personally I, 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 I love it when things are bottom up and random and varied and, and, and so on and so forth. But when we talk about our information order, it seems to me that the institutions we work in tend to be taken over by people who very often, even though they claim to work in a bottom up manner, actually don't. Um, you notice this, for example, there's a lot of hubbub in the university about the new about, about, about the new strategic plan. And one of the criticisms that is being raised is that it's been written by administrators who have a very top-down vision of what a university should be, although they claim that they respect all the disciplines and the plurality and so on and so forth. Well, none of the academic, or, or very few academics have been consulted. Um, I don't know a lot about this, but, but this is a criticism that has been made. But it seems to me that very often this is the case, and that we live in a world where most of the institutions that shape policy or that shape outcomes in the world we live in are increasingly governed by that sort of top-down jargon that has been strongly influenced by a, 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 a tradition in economics discourse which, which, talks, which, which deifies certain terms like efficiency and growth and, and, and whatnot. And somehow the pluralist side hasn't been able to sort of mount a meaningful counter discourse against that, or, or at least that's sometimes how it seems to me. You raise a whole uh, set of very valid and interesting points. Um, let me start backwards. Uh, there is a line of thought in and around the whole ICT's area. Um, which is a very radical, if not revolutionary, line of thought, which says the multitude will be enabled by ICTs and overturn all this top-down stuff. And basically, it is a very technology-driven dri view. Um, and basically, it, uh, to put it simply, we can wait. And wait for Godot, maybe, I don't know. Um, there are some people who think that if we wait, this enabling power will you know, sprout. <laughs> the voices of the populace will be heard, and it will make a difference, and it will be acted upon, and you won't get this top-down organizational control of information. Mm, it's a very, very seductive argument. But I actually think that um, institutions don't work that way myself. And I also wouldn't put it as strongly you did. <coughs> as you did. In other words, yes, I know that, um, well, certainly the LSE is 
the accountability people from the top are ever more pervasive. And ever more do we must do, must we have databases that count our every movement and every movement of students, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We resist. We win some, we lose some. Now broaden that into the out the bigger world. I, the question I'm asking is not the let's sit back and do nothing and wait for the empowerment to arise out of the multitude and ICTs, but rather to con self consciously and actively think about how one might engage. Um, I said we don't study enough the power relations, both the micro circuits of power from the bottom up and those from the top down and the spaces in between. We need to do more empirical research on how this works. I think that ICTs can and do make a difference. You introduce a database into uh, one of the big five management consultancy companies. You think the top brass actually read all the reports generated by their IT databases? Uh -uh. Do you think the banks? The merchant banks, the top people, read all of those huge information databases about financial capital? No, this is why we got ourselves into the trouble we're in, the financial crisis. So yes, there's all sorts of disconnects. And I'm not trying to paint you a rosy picture that says, I know how to develop the institutions, how to design institutions which will deal with these top-down, bottom-up power relations. But I am saying that we should treat it as both a theoretical question, as is it possible? And an empirical question, in practice, what can people do to make a um, bigger difference in the interests of social welfare or um, social justice, however you want to describe it? So that's kind of one answer to, the, um, or a reaction, if you like. On the China-Singapore, uh, ch sorry, China issue, I'm no specialist on China, but let me give you a more a broadly based Asia example. I've been studying um, uh, countries like Japan and uh, Singapore for a long time in terms of how they have <coughs> been trying to deal with, in a different context, the commercial side of information and ICTs to enable their economies and the political side, which for them, given their organization of the state, etc., is maybe not as authoritarian as China has been, but it has certainly been quite closed and top down. And they have all sorts of in-between models and explanations for what they're doing. Does this necessarily mean it's a solution that should be transferred into some of the poorest countries in the world who are trying to make ICTs some kind of strategic solution for their poverty, etc.? No, I don't think so. But I think there are clear lessons there, as there are from China and the tussles that they're having over that I hear all the time from our Chinese students about what to do with all these microblogs. Are they going to undermine the authority of the state? How will they develop their <coughs> huge enterprises and engage in world trade, etc., around ICTs at the same time as they try to reduce the problems of the huge gap in income in that country? So there's a whole lot of interesting issues there, too. I, I agree. And I, if I may, I got one more thought on this. <laughs> in the information systems literature and in the whole ICTs for development debate, especially in this country, but not only in this country, DFID, Department for International Development, has a very science-driven model of how one should implement ICTs. So, uh, most uh, development practitioners rail against what are called log frames. Before you take ICTs to somewhere with funding, you must know uh, absolutely what the outcomes will be. You must be able to describe exactly who's going to benefit, how they're going to benefit, and when they're going to benefit. In the Global Pulse um, ideas about setting up big data labs, one was going to be in um, northern Uganda. Um, <coughs> it was a big, huge document before anybody ever actually went to Uganda about what was agreed with the Ugandan top-level officials about how to impl implement these huge mega databases for the strategic welfare of that country and the region around it. It hasn't worked. And it hasn't worked for some of the reasons which I was describing, which aren't to do with what Uganda wants or doesn't want. It's to do with the top-down officials who see that their model was top-down. <laughs> it doesn't even work in their own terms let alone in terms of the ethical considerations in the countries concerned. So there I would say there's another space in between for hope, for learning. 
And in my view, what more can we ask for other than hope and learning and a bit of resistance here and there? Hi, thanks. Um, I think what you have to say is really interesting from a material and a spatial perspective as well. Because I look at this as so many studies, ICTs in Africa, and I see very little play in this balance, depending where you are in the world, compared to the UK, the US, sort of countries where you could find that space in between. Because in poorer places, obviously, technology is very expensive. It relies on other facilitating mechanisms like infrastructure and governance, which are also expensive and hard to come by. You know, if you don't have electricity, you can't have the technology and you can't have the space in between the people using the technology in different ways, different points of view on that technology. And so I guess my question is, how do you, how do you talk about this as a single balance? How do you address this from a policy perspective, for instance? How do you talk about how we should address different areas of the world in this context? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I don't have a good answer in the sense that I have constantly railed against the notion that I'm a development person. I don't have a message to deliver to um, the Minister of Information in some country. Um, I've always, Eugenio and I used to discuss this endlessly. Um, I'd say, I can't supervise you because I'm not a development person. <laughs> You're interested in development. My knee-jerk reaction is to say, you don't go and give the message to other countries about how to do this. You work collaboratively across institutions at various levels to see what can be an accommodation to the different interests. Um, whether or not one can do it and create something, I think one of the most intriguing areas to look into is some of the participatory action projects uh, that come out of anthropology, particularly, where my initial reaction is that people don't go and tell people what to do, they go and they listen, etc. My concern is that that's all very well at a kind of a micro level, but how do you attach that to the more top-down governance establishment? And I think, again, and education and learning and a critical stance towards these issues, enabling people to understand what the dynamics are that are going on politically, socially, training of journalists, et cetera, is one step along the road. But I don't think it's a case of you know experts running in and saying, here's how to do it. That's the last thing I would recommend. And yet, there is a consultancy industry out there, and a highly paid one, which I have encountered many, 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 many times, which does bring the templates, that brings the models for um, e-money, for e-health, for e-education, for e-any sector you care to think of, from somewhere else, and says, as Eugenio demonstrated really nicely in his um, project, buy flat panel digital screens for every school in Ethiopia, and will you have will have solved the problem of higher education training, right? Mm -hmm. Do it, <laughs> and they resisted the outside World Bank message that said do that, and then decided for themselves that's what they would do, and that is why it does. It's, there's no easy solutions. It was the internal dynamics to resist the World Bank that led to that investment decision. So you would have content, and think about the content at the time, as I understand it. You can disagree with me, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so I'm not here to give you a magical solution. I don't think you can design from the top. I guess I'm asking how you address it within the UN system, which mm -hmm. is right now where you're describing yourself as situated. You carry on struggling, and you choose to walk in the corridor. And if you go, you have to hope that you can have a dialogue. And over the years, I would say that um, the narrative has changed in some places and in some quarters, which is why I'm just talking about Ostrom and collaborative uh, collective action on the market side as well as the other side. Mm 
think Ralph had a question, but did, did you have a follow-up to this? Yeah, just a, just a very small comment. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, find, I find this very interesting in the sense that it seems somehow paradoxical where the United Nations, which is very much a centralized organization and, and would therefore be very conducive to top-down thinking, that at some point needs to, it, 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 it seems to be, to be an organization which works in, in one paradigm, which has to try and sort of create solutions in, in, in a different paradigm. And, I, and I'm personally, I'm, I'm sometimes wondering, maybe we should just stop. Mm. Maybe, maybe we should s s simply tr put, j just for the sake of experiment, put all these large international organizations on hold for a year, maybe five years, and see what happens. I mean, I come from Belgium. My country didn't have a central government for about a year and a half, and it went, it, it, it did wonderfully. You have 11 million people, I think. <laughs> <laughs> In China. Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, When I wrote the first Knowledge Societies uh, report in 19, actually doing it was 1995. It was in the days of, um, early days of fiber optics, big days of satellites, hardly any internet, goodness, who knew what it was, practically. And I was part of a team of um, 50 countries, including the Arab states, who were involved in overseeing the writing of that document, and we had to meet collectively places like um, India and Jamaica and Durban over a couple year period. And it was totally split down the middle between the technologists representing the different countries, telecoms, computing, software, digital content, and everyone else, economists, sociologists, <laughs> political politi politicians. They wouldn't even meet in the same room for longer than about 10 minutes. Mm. And I, for my sins, decided I had enough of this. So I went out and got, I went to night school and got an engineering degree around about that time for the simple reason that I wanted to be able to go into those places and have some credibility, not a whole lot, but some. And what have I seen over those years since then? I've seen not the idea that everybody needs to go out and become an engineer or vice versa but that there is a lot more listening. Not necessarily about every issue of human development, but when it comes to the internet and technology, there is, in my view, over the long term, more listening. And I think the single reason is, is because people see that the league tables on internet access and the notion of leapfrogging technologically as opposed to find your pathway to development, has more and more been shown by external circumstances, nothing to do with ICTs, to be problematic. The world economy is in a mess, and it's nothing to do with ICTs per se, or necessarily. So people are having to rethink. And when people have to rethink, I think it opens up spaces for the in-between. What fills it? may, as um, you said a minute ago on the open access thing, may be a replica of the past, but I don't think it's necessary that it be a replica of the past. After all, even Marxists don't believe in determination necessarily, over-determination. They always believe that there is a space of negotiation and possibility. Mm -hmm. So that's my message. How is that space of possibility working today? Can we study it empirically? even in places like the UN, and even where you think <coughs> the UN is doing nothing but wrongness, <laughs> there are always spaces at every level. And as I also said at the very beginning, it's not the case that the micro level is perfect. It really isn't. We wouldn't have the killing that's going on in certain countries today at the bottom level if micro bottom up protest was always in the interests of enabling human beings to live the lives they choose to live. If you'll allow it, can we take one more question? No. Uh, yeah, actually, on that very last note, um, enabling the lives you choose to live, I was wondering, you said to, uh, in response to Lynette, that you 
didn't consider yourself a development person, but I just wonder, um, and it's an honest question, uh, what is the OECD's current idea of development? And if so, given that you're involved with them, would you like to shift it? The OECD? Uh, yeah. What is their It's not the OECD I'm what involved is, in. Oh, sorry. It's UNESCO. Oh, sorry. What is, sorry, that's what I meant. What is UNESCO's idea, of, normative idea of development? How would you like to shift it? Can I ask one more, or have one more critical comment here, which is that on Ostrom, uh, you have this very much as a, as a commons idea for information. But one way of reading Ostrom is that she's very good on something like natural resources, which are finite, but a lot of information is not finite. So does that actually apply? I mean, Wikipedia is not something that you need to apply Ostrom's kind of commons idea, commons ideas to, uh, because it's not like a forest or a you know, finite number of fish or what have you. Um, there's proclivities to wanting to make it finite, though, that's the first point, um, institutionally. And um, secondly, well, sadly, as you know, she died, so <laughs> it's unlikely that she'd be able to extend her, her work into um, the ICT area. But her co-author, um, Charlotte Hess, um, and others have been seriously developing her ideas. I and mean, there was a conference in Belgium um, in September of last year. Um, which was on the applicability of her ideas in commons, which don't necessarily have the characteristics of traditional kinds of um, limited resources. And the big emphasis, there was a strand on ICTs and on information, big emphasis was on the management aspect and the variety of management approaches that some of her ideas would suggest. Not that they were directly transferable and applicable, but that there was something there and there were about 300 people there, very interdisciplinary, economists, technologists, um, lawyers, you know, a bit like the OI, uh, OAI kind of spectrum of types of people. So it, it, was, it was very provocative and in interesting. Um, UNESCO? Uh, well, I don't really think institutions speak with one voice. <laughs> so it's almost impossible to say what is UNESCO's view because it's comprised, obviously, of <coughs> director generals and all sorts of people running around and having different ideas. I would say that if you contrast it with the ITU view, the ITU view sounds like, looks like, is measuring information and technology, as it has always done, pushing the infrastructure angle more, probably, than applications. And UNESCO is more on the side of um, intriguing ideas about open information, et cetera although perish the thought that you could actually talk about um, relaxing the enforcement of copyright um, easily. And you get into all sorts of hot water when you start talking about freedom of information still. Um, but that's the spectrum. So if I had to say, where are they? They're more over here, but very shyly so. And certain things they don't want to say than they are over here. At the same time, this in-between space, as we all know, is changing. The hybrid models are all over the place. We look for them. Some people like Benkler would claim, well, maybe he wouldn't claim, but he has written at least that this one is going to win. Right? It doesn't completely do away with ownership of information, but it's, this is going to win. We we'll just, again, wait. Keep on developing the technology. It's unstoppable. There are others who say, well, no, uh, we don't actually know, but there's a space here. We need to have a normative position on how to manage in this space. So if I was talking about the management of technological innovation, I would be talking about that space. If I was talking about cultural perspectives mm -hmm. on that space, I would be saying, what can we learn from sociological theory and theories of power about that space? If I was a historian, I would be wanting to bring a critical lens to look at are there patterns that are repeating themselves in terms of who gets to own the technology, the information, access, user-generated content, all the rest of it? Whose hands does it fall into? What are the generative possibilities from the bottom up? What is happening from the top down? Where do they meet? I would be saying, what can we learn from that? 
not to look into a crystal ball of the future, but to actually engage with real human beings who I quite frankly believe deserve a better life. Not because of the magic of technology, but because they just deserve a better life. So if there's some space in which information, knowledge, and ICTs can make a difference, then shouldn't we have something to say about that and make it policy relevant where we can? That's basically what I think. Well, I guess we, we got to the end of um, this very interesting one hour and a half. And I think it was a fantastic way to start the series. And just to, to give you a bit of perspective, I'm really happy that you mentioned also the anthropological approaches. We will have a couple of anthropologists that which look at ICTs uh, in a different way, very uh, specific, looking at the places like Hubera, for example. But from a bottom up, uh, it is uh, quite different, non-normative, either from the inside or from the outside. Uh, um, just a couple of words about the uh, next uh, event uh, um, next Wednesday, because it's, it's again, it's, di it's quite different. We can call it kind of a practitioner space. We will have uh, Abdurashid Duhale, which is the person who started uh, one of the most important or the most important money transfer uh, system in Africa, is Somali, and uh, it will talk about innovative ways, very locally driven, Somali doesn't have a government. Uh, uh, the ICT sector, as you can imagine, is quite problematic. But even in the absence of institution, of a state, of the external intervention, you can see how innovation really transforms relationship between individual, individual and the state, uh, and individual information, uh, the, inf the international organization. So I hope to see you, many of you. But uh, first of all, I really think, I really want to thank Robin. It was a great way to stay out. So please, thank you.